If you've been following along with my main series, you probably noticed a few odd features of the terrain gen. One of the most notable ones is probably in the thumbnail of the first devlog, where there is a lake with a few doors around it. If you're reading through the level gen code on GitHub, you probably realize that the system I showed you guys can't make any terrain details like that. This video is going to explain what's going on there and how my generators add these features to the dungeon. These features are something known as structures, or room definitions in the game code, and they're used to add more complex and interesting environments for players to explore. When they're used in conjunction with normal dungeon generators, they could add a whole new level of depth and intrigue to gameplay. And the best part is, they're really not all that hard to implement once you understand the base framework for level generation. First off, we need to create a file system for actually loading the structures. When the game starts, one of our first steps should be to load a list of special rooms from the disk. Since I want to make the system simple enough that players could add rooms without any programming knowledge, I'm opting to use the name binary tag system. If you've ever played Minecraft, this is a file structure used to store levels and player data on the disk. And before you ask if it's legal to do so, uh, I don't know. Anyways, in our room definition class, we want to define the following important details. The room name, its width and height, arrange the levels where it could spawn if applicable, booleans for whether stairs can spawn in the room, and whether a room is mandatory feature for the floor. Like the spawn range, these are only stored as necessary. A byte array for the tiles, and a boolean array for the light map. Now we'll create a load function that takes an MBT compound tag as the input parameter. Inside this function, we're going to load the structure data by reading their respective data entries in the compound tag. Fortunately, this part is super easy, since we just need to know the name and data type of the respective entry. And we'll also add a save function that creates a new compound tag that we could add to an atlas file. Atlas files are a relatively simple concept. Each file contains a list of the structure tags we just defined with the room definition class. That way we could add and remove new structures without needing to write new code or modify existing code. Going into the Atlas class, we're going to create a loader function that actually grabs the structures from disk. Here, we look for a folder called Atlas and go through each file in that directory. For each file that has the Atlas extension of ATL, we deflate it with gzip and look for a tag list called rooms. Then go through it and add each room definition to a static array list. In order to actually place these rooms into the dungeon, we need to go back to the generator code established in the second episode. In the room class, we're going to add a variable for room definitions that's set to negative 1 by default. In the generator class, we'll add functions for picking random structures in the atlas and placing them into the dungeon. In the picker function, we run through the list and look for the following details. Is our current depth within the range set by the structure definition? If not, we set the probability of generating it to zero. Is the structure mandatory for the current floor? If it is, we'll just return its ID. Once we've figured out what structures we could generate, we just roll a die and pick one at random. In the prep function, we take the structure ID and figure out if we want to rotate or mirror it. Going into our old draw room function, we're going to add a check to see if there's a valid ID attached. If there is, we'll go through the tile and light map arrays and set them into the dungeon, but not before figuring out the correct map coordinates as per the rotation we want to apply to the structure. If we're mirroring it on either axis, we simply take the length of the room definition on that axis and subtract our pointer's position in the room by its length minus one. If we're flipping it, we just swap the x and y coordinates of our pointers within the room. Once that's done, we return a new pointer with the adjusted map position. Now in Powder, you get one special room per floor, so we'll go with that approach for now and have the first room of each floor be a predefined structure. And when we start drawing corridors to the other rooms, we'll pick a random doorway or empty tile on the outer bounds of the room and begin building our path from there. For in the case of our cave levels, we'll have our first walker start from outside one of the doors and moving in the opposite direction. And before we close out the generator, we'll just do a quick check of the doors along the outer bounds of the structure, removing any that are obstructed by solid tiles. So now we have a way to generate more complex rooms that could have traps, puzzles, and other goodies. Anyways, I really hope you enjoyed this video and maybe learned something. I realized I left this detail out of the original video on level generators and wanted to make an addendum, but I didn't feel like I could make this into a proper devlog without really stretching the explanation. So I'm trying out some shorter form videos just to test the waters and see what you guys think. If you liked it and you want to see more of these bite-sized explanations, just let me know. 